Okay, I'm ready to, to begin. The topic that I've been assigned for this period, let me read it off to you. It is an Austrian critique of mainstream economics. So I'm going to be talking about an Austrian critique of mainstream economics. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, if we had a Venn diagram and here is Austrian economics and here is, uh, call it the mainstream or the neoclassical economists, that th there is a, uh, an overlap. We Austrians uh, have certain views that are unique to us. They have certain views that are unique to them. And then there's this overlap in between the two. And I'll be mainly speaking of the this part where we disagree with them, but let me first say that there are areas of agreement. Uh, for example, um, most economists, whether Austrian or mainstream, favor free trade. Uh, most economists, uh, whether mainstream or Austrian, uh, think that the minimum wage law will create unemployment for unskilled workers, uh, think that rent control will take uh, resources away from residential rental units and make it worse for uh, tenants. So th there is uh, an overlap, a great overlap. Uh, there's even uh, an overlap in terms of econometrics. Uh, some people, radical, radical Austrians, not me, I'm a moderate, that's why they call me Walter Moderate Block. <laughs> uh, Jeff Herbener on this one is an extremist. He says that there's no use in Austrian economics for uh, statistics or econometrics. And in my view, if what you're interested in is an empirical issue, well then why not? For example, uh, the elasticity of shoes. Uh, we know that there's a downward sloping demand curve for shoes. And if we raise the price of shoes by 10%, we know that fewer shoes will be purchased. But how many fewer? 1%, 2%, 20% what? What's the elasticity of the demand curve for shoes? And uh, we Austrians really have no dog in that fight. We're happy to go along with the mainstream people and say, well, if you want to find that out, the way to do it is uh, uh, through econometrics or statistics or uh, mathematical economics. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so we're not against math per se, period, uh, but we do have great reservations about it because a lot of math and economics, uh, it assumes a smooth curves because if you... Uh, want to get, uh, I don't know, uh, a slope of a curve, you can only, whatever it is, say price and quantity, and that's say some sort of demand curve, and you want to pick the slope of it, you have to uh, take the, um, the slope. And you can only get a slope if, if the, the curve is continuous. And if you want to differentiate or integrate a curve, it has to be a continuous curve. But we Austrians believe that there is no smooth curves out there or uh, that depict reality because um, economics uh, discusses human action and human action is discrete. Uh, so you don't get uh, curves like that. You get some sort of jagged uh, lines uh, in that regard. And therefore, uh, we have great suspicion of it. For example, let me give you uh, an example of that. Uh, here is a, an average cost curve. And uh, average cost curve, quantity, price. And uh, the mainstream think that the best place to be is at the bottom of the average cost curve. And if you have a downward sloping demand curve, which means you're not in perfect competition, well, then the demand curve has got to be uh, uh, tangent to the, to the average cost curve at an inefficient point. Everyone following this? OK. Uh, but Murray uh, Rothbard in his uh, Man, Economy, and the State says, look, th this whole thing depends upon smooth curves. And what you're doing is you're letting the mathematical tail wag the economics dog, whereas it should be the opposite. The economics is more important. The math is just uh, a handmaiden of the economics for economists. For mathematicians, fine, let the math, you know, Math uberalis for mathematicians, but not for us. So what Murray does is he draws the curve like this. And then he says, 
look, uh, here's an average cost curve, there's quantity, there's price, and we can be at the bottom of the uh, average cost curve even with a downward sloping demand curve. <laughs> and, and the whole reason that you're not is because of a smooth curved assumption. So th that's sort of completely backwards. So that would be just one example of math and, and economics where we Austrians disagree with the mainstream people. Those of you who are going to graduate school in economics, especially in the US, not so much in Europe where they're more Austrian, but in, in the US, it's mainly math. You, you, I had uh, some graduate student or a student who graduated from Loyola went off to graduate school and took one look at the micro text and it was all math and she didn't want to do math for five years so she quit. Uh, I wonder about that but that's a whole other story. Okay, uh, so that's one area where we disagree and here I, I would say that um, getting back to this diagram I'm, I'm going to be going over many many areas where the Austrians disagree with the mainstream and I'm going to take the Austrian point of view, I'm an Austrian economist, and I'll be uh, taking the Austrian uh, point against the mainstream. Okay, uh, I've got about 15 things like this on my list. I don't know how far I'll get through, but I'll just keep pushing until we uh, come to the end of the period. Okay, another one is this thing called the synthetic a priori. What's the synthetic a priori? A synthetic a priori statement is a statement that's apodictically necessarily true and yet has something to do with the real world. And this is one of the uh, sticking points for me when I first uh, was introduced to Austrian economics. I was introduced to it by Murray Rothbard uh, just when I was finishing up my PhD at Columbia, which was a logical positivist kind of a place, a mainstream place if ever there was one. My main mentor was Gary Becker, Nobel Prize winner, and I was a logical positivist and I couldn't understand how that could possibly be. It seemed like magical, it seemed cultish, it seemed weird, it seemed ridiculous that there were actual statements that have to do with the real world and yet we know them absolutely for sure and we don't have to test them. We know them just by the logic of them. Uh, the, the, the way the mainstream sees this is there are two kinds of things and the two shall never meet. One is analytic or tautology or a priori. 2 plus 2 is 4, the Pythagorean theorem, the all bachelors are unmarried, uh, men, things like that, which are necessarily true, but they don't uh, impact the world. Uh, they're uh, more how we use language, that sort of a thing. And on the other hand, there are empirical statements that uh, do impact the world and do describe the world and do explain the world and uh, help us understand the world. For example, it's sunny outside or it's nice and cool in here but it's very hot outside or there are about uh, 50 people in the room. These are empirical statements which are not necessarily true. You have to test them to, to go out and look and see if they're right and they have to be falsifiable. We have to know what it would mean for them not to be true. And Never the twain shall meet, so that there are analytic statements that are necessarily true that don't impact the world, and then there are empirical statements, uh, 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 a posteriori statements, that do impact the world, that do describe the world, that help us understand and explain the world, but we have to test them. And where do you get a, a, a statement that uh, has both? Well, we Austrians, not me originally, but uh, Murray Rothbard, Hans Hoppe, other Austrians, have come up with a series of them. For example, if I trade you this pen for my watch, it must mean that I value the pen more than the watch, at least in anticipations right now, and it must mean that you value the pen more than uh, the watch more than the pen. Necessarily true. Why else would you do the trade? Now, you might think that if you make the trade, I'll give you an A in the course. Who knows? Or you might think if you make the trade, I'll be your best friend. I don't know why you're doing it. All I know is there's something about this watch you like more than pen because you're giving up the pen to get the watch. And there's something about this uh, pen that I like more than the watch, otherwise I wouldn't give it up. This is necessarily true. I got into a big debate with what was his name from um, George Mason, the guy that wrote about the irrationality of democracy? Oh, um, Brian, Kaplan. Brian Kaplan. Got into a big debate on, on this, and he wouldn't even concede this, that this is necessarily true. He kept coming up, well, maybe people are lying or something like that. 
uh, it's hard to deal with these people. <laughs> I used to be one, so I can sort of understand. But uh, they're, they're fixed. It can't be. And now I'm going to read off a whole bunch of other statements that are synthetic a priori. And I say that this distinguishes Austrians from the mainstream because they don't cotton to this. They think it's cultish, it's religious, and they dismiss us as religious cultists. OK, so one is the gain from trade, the opposite ranking of two goods. There's a tendency for profits to be zero. A tendency. Whenever you say there's a tendency, you can't falsify it. You can't falsify it. Because I say there's a tendency for profits to fall to zero. And right now, profits aren't zero. Some are positive, some are negative, some are zero. Well, that doesn't refute the fact that there's a tendency. And yet, we know there's a tendency. And there's also a tendency for profits in all industries to be the same, the same zero, but at least the same. Because if they're high here and low here, the resources will flow out of here and into here, pushing down the profits here and pushing up the profits there until you get some sort of equilibration. There's a tendency for markets to equilibrate. We never reach equilibrium or the evenly rotating economy, but there's a tendency for it. Uh, others are um, law of marginal utility. Whenever the supply of a good increases by one unit, provided each unit is regarded of equal serviceability by a person, the value attached to the unit must decrease. Diminishing margin utility. Uh, uh, another one is the Ricardian uh, law of association, comparative advantage. Uh, whenever minimum wage laws are enforced that require wages to be higher than existing market wages, involuntary unemployment will result. Whenever the quantity of money is increased while the demand for money is held uh, is unchanged, the purchasing power of money will fall. So uh, Austrian economics is littered with synthetic a priori statements. Statements that are necessarily true and yet impact on the real world. Uh, the Austrian <coughs> business cycle theory is a synthetic a, a priori statement. It's a much bigger statement. It takes a lot of uh, premises to get it out, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But that's another one. So these are a priori, unfalsifiable. And people like Krugman will say, well, if it's unfalsifiable, it's, it's magic. So this is a, a crucial distinction uh, between the two. OK, another one is this thing about testability. Let me tell you a little story about my dissertation uh, with uh, Gary Becker. And uh, my dissertation was roughly of the uh, sort that, uh, well, all econometric equations are of the sort a equals um, uh, y equals a plus b1x plus b2x2 plus b3x3 plus an error term. And what I was trying to do is, here was my rent control variable. And what I said is that the more rent control, the lousier the housing would be. Holding constant, what else do I have to hold constant? Well, wealth. I have to hold constant. Uh, anything else that might impact the quality of housing, such as weather. You know, If it's very bad weather, you'll have lousier housing than otherwise. And, and here was, uh, say, good, good housing. And what I expected was that uh, this uh, thing would be a negative. Namely, there'd be a negative relationship between more rent control and less housing quality, holding everything else constant. That was my dissertation, roughly. Uh, there was a lot more, but th that, that was one of the points. And most of the time, I got the right sign. And most of the time, thank God, I, uh, it was statistically significant at the 5 or even the 1 or 2% level, sometimes at the 10% level. But every once in a while, I get the wrong sign. Don't ask. I got the wrong sign. And every once in a while, the wrong sign was statistically significant. So how did Gary Becker react to this? Well, if he were a neoclassical, what he should have said was, well, you know, maybe rent control doesn't work the way we think it does. You know, I mean, rent control is, uh, yeah, there's the supply, there's the demand, there's quantity, there's price. Uh, that you put a maximum price on housing, demand is greater than supply, there's a shortage. Uh, the, the usual rent control story that you get in Economics 101. Becker didn't say that. He was too polite to say, but this is really what he meant to say. He meant to say, block you moron, go out and do it again until you get it right. So what was testing what? <laughs> was my econometrics testing the uh, supply and demand and rent control, of which we all know, and, and the Austrians and the neoclassists agree on that? 
No, it was the other way around. The, the theory was testing my econometrics. A very similar thing happened with rent control, uh, sorry, with the minimum wage. Now we all know that the minimum wage is a, a very similar sort of thing, only now we have um, wage and, and here we have the quantity of labor. And if you put a, a, a minimum wage above equilibrium, you're gonna have a surplus, namely unemployment. So Card and Kruger come out with this cockamamie thing and uh, there was some uh, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, one of them raised the minimum wage and then Cardin Kruger tried to see if there was a difference in the unemployment rate for unskilled workers between the two because of this uh, increase in the minimum wage. And this is what uh, Krugman relies on. This is what uh, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton relies on, Bernie Sanders, everybody loves Card Krugman on the left. So again, if Gary Becker and Newmark and other of these mainstream people were really logical positivists, if they were really uh, neoclassical economists, you see my thesis, if you scratch a good economist, you're gonna find an Austrian, whether they admit that they're Austrians or not. So, <laughs> so what they should have said is, oh, well, maybe economic law works differently in New Jersey. I mean, it's pronounced New Jersey, so who knows what the, <laughs> what's going on in New Jersey. Uh, maybe uh, the minimum wage story only works 95% of the time or 98% of the time. Uh, they would have been uh, moderate here, but no, they had fire in their eyes. What they did is, first of all, a replicatability. They called up the same people that Cardin Kruger called up to get the information, and they couldn't replicate it. So that's one problem. But they came out with real fire in their eyes. The idea was that this is wrong and we're going to get that Cardin Kruger people, but they shouldn't have done that. Only Austrians should do that. So I uh, now am awarding these people honorary Austrian degrees. <laughs> They're not going to accept it, but I'm going to award them. Whether they like it or not, I'm going to you know, pin the tail on the donkey. I'm going to pin Austrianism on a lot of these mainstream people that are good economists, even though they don't think they're Austrians. By the way, uh, uh, the reason we call it Austrian economics has got nothing to do with the economics of Austria. It's because the people who started it came from Austria, uh, Mises, Bamberg, Menger, Hayek, we're all in Austria. It's the same with Chicago economics. It's got nothing to do with the economics of the city Chicago. It's rather that Friedman and Becker and Stigler just happened to be at the University of Chicago and had a unique uh, uh, look at, at economics. Okay, so we've now had two or three of the 15 or so um, elements, and let me go on uh, to another one. What else have I got? Let's talk about entrepreneurship. For Austrians, entrepreneurship is very important. Israel Kersner wrote a book, Competition and Entrepreneurship. Uh, Peter Klein, uh, one of our fellow teachers here, is an expert in entrepreneurship and s uh, specializes in it and emphasizes the importance of entrepreneurship. Whereas if you look at any mainstream uh, textbook, what you're gonna find is land, labor, and capital. And if you're lucky, in the index, the, the word entrepreneurship will be there and it'll be one page. And if you're not lucky, they just ignore it. I might be exaggerating a little bit, but not much. Whereas for, if there was an Austrian textbook, and there are a few, uh, David Gordon wrote one and there were a few others, entrepreneurship is, I don't say the only thing, uh, there are other, land, labor, and capital are also important, but the, you know, entrepreneurship is very, very important. Uh, the entrepreneur is the, the one who um, sees an opportunity and uh, uh, sets up a business. You know, um, uh, and there is a debate between Murray Rothbard and Israel Kirzner on this. Uh, Israel Kirzner has this thing called the pure entrepreneur who has no capital whatsoever, whereas Murray uh, insists that it's a capitalist entrepreneur. And I'm, I'm on Murray Rothbard's side of this particular debate. Uh, Israel Kersner says, well, you, you have this idea of entrepreneurship, but uh, if you want to do something, if you want to impact the world, you have to buy or sell or invest or do something. You, you just can't have pure entrepreneurship divorced from anything else. And if you borrow money from someone else, well, you had collateral with which to borrow it in the first place, and you had some labor to go to the bank and ask for money. So I don't think that there's any uh, free-floating pure entrepreneurship, but, but entrepreneurship is very important, whereas for the mainstream, it's not at all important. Another is uh, the difference between ordinal and cardinal utility. Ordinal, cardin ordinal utility is ordering. I like apples better than bananas, and bananas better than carrots. 
that is legitimate and fine, and that is a, a, a fine uh, distinction. And we Austrians uh, believe in ordinal economics. We support it. It's a rational thing. It helps shed light on economic issues. Fine. What is cardinal utility? Cardinal is counting. Utils. So uh, an apple is 10 utils, a, carrot, a banana is 20 utils, and, and a, a carrot, an apple is 10, a banana is 20, and a carrot is 30. Therefore, the carrot is three times as much utility as the apple. And the banana is twice as much as the apple, and the carrot is 150% uh, uh, more enjoyment than... This is nonsense. This is nonsense on a stick. Uh, uh, <laughs> not nonsense. Uh, I'm getting the word, not a pogo stick, nonsense on something. I, what, what, what am I missing here? Nonsense on something. I'm, I'm not sure what, but on steroids maybe. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now, you might think, well, this is just sort of airy-fairy crap, and you know, who cares about the... I mean, what is, what's the importance of it? Well, the importance of it is antitrust. Let me give you a little antitrust stuff, which the mainstream loves. And Austrians reject entirely, whereas the Chicago School is supposedly a free enterprise school, and they have a sort of a moderate position. Let me, let me get into that. So first, I'm going to draw the usual uh, complicated uh, curve. Uh, here's the average cost curve. There's the marginal cost curve hitting the average cost curve at the bottom point. You always have to be at the bottom point. Quantity price. Here is a demand curve. Here is a marginal revenue curve. We know that the perfectly competitive industry will be right there. And we know that uh, where marginal cost hits marginal revenue is where the quantity of the monopolist will be. And he'll move his way up to the demand curve. And that'll be where the monopolist will be. And here is the price of the monopolist. How many people have seen this before? Good. OK, I'm glad that we're, we're in sync. Um, and now, uh, what do we have? We have uh, profits. And, and here's the indictment of, on the part of the mainstream of monopoly. And uh, one is that the price of the monopolist is higher than the price of the co uh, competitor. And don't ask me why a high price is bad, but high prices are bad. <laughs> don't ask. And we know that the quantity of the uh, um, competitor uh, the quantity of the competitor is greater than the uh, quantity of monopolist, and quantity is good. So the more quantity and the lower the price, the better. And notice that monopoly is bad on both these counts, and perfect competition is good on both these counts. The third one is, what's the third one? Profits. Profits are evil. We all stipulate that, you know. Who could, who could uh, disagree? <laughs> profits are evil. And, and the, uh, the profits of the perfectly competitive is zero, and the profits of the monopolist is this little box here, the shaded box, right? The, call it the box, the shaded box. That's profit, and, and profit are e profits are evil. Uh, so, you know, that's the third indictment. And then the fourth indictment, the, the real biggie, the one that really sticks in their craw, uh, the evil thing is this triangle here. And this is the dead weight loss. And, and this really bugs the crap out of them. I mean, you know, you, you, it's sort of like, you know, a cross against the, who, who are the guys you wave a cross at and they run away? The vampires. Well, you sort of wave dead weight loss at a, at a mainstream economist, and the, you know, the, they, they get scared. I mean, it's horrible for them. And this dead weight loss is a total exercise in interpersonal comparison to utility. So this stuff about ordinal, you see, it's not only ordinal and cardinal, but uh, before, I, I'll get back to this in a second, but every time you have a a diminishing marginal utility curve, and there is quantity and there is um, price. Uh, sorry, uh, this is marginal utility. Whenever you draw a curve with an axis, you're counting utils, right? So this curve, uh, from the Austrian point of view, is illegitimate because it's quantitative. And we've said 
to my satisfaction at least, and I'm sure most of you agree, that ordinal is a reasonable way of looking at utility. But utils, this says that uh, if you have this many uh, units, x units, then the, the, uh, the utils are, are x. And, and if you have y units, then the, the margin of utility goes to p, uh, margin of utility y. This is an exercise in uh, uh, cardinal utility. But this diagram here is even worse than cardinal utility. It's not only cardinal utility, it's interpersonal. It's even worse somehow. It's bad enough to say that I like carrots three times as much as I like apples. But it's even crazier to say, well, I like carrots uh, twice as much as you like carrots. I mean, how do you compare? I mean, it, it's just crazy. So what this is saying is that we, the people, get utility under the demand curve. So let me uh, be more colorful here. So the uh, utility that we get is under the red. Uh, can you see that? Is that okay? You got it? Whereas what are the costs? The cost is the area under the marginal cost curve in blue. And the difference is the dead weight loss. And what the monopolist is doing is cheating us out of stuff. Cheating us out of the difference between QM and QC. Because if he was a nice guy, if he didn't uh, want to create a market failure, which is a whole other thing, the, the, the mainstream loves market failure, monopoly, uh, the public goods, uh, externalities, uh, unequal income. I mean, in order to get into the American Economic Review, you either have to have just math or you have to come up with a new um, market failure. They just love market failures, whereas for Austrians, there's no such thing as a market failure. There are imperfect people, entrepreneurs make mistakes, but that's not what they mean by market failure. What they mean by market failure is something that the government could step in and, and tell the, the monopolist, you know, produce at QC, or we'll break you up, or we'll nationalize you. Those are the three uh, solutions to, to, the, to the problem. Uh, so this is an exercise in interpersonal comparison utility. Namely, they're saying that the buyers value it at the red area, the sellers, it only costs us at the blue area, and, and yet it's not produced. Let me give you a real uh, world example. Uh, here we have uh, Djokovic, who is the best tennis player nowadays, give or take, and Djokovic enters 15 tournaments a year. He really should enter 25. He's cheating us out of 10 tournaments a year, that dirty rat. <laughs> And what we should do is use the antitrust against him and make him play more. I mean, look, if he plays an extra 10 tournaments, his shoulder is going to hurt or his knees are going to hurt or whatever, and he only picks 15. But thanks to neoclassical economics, we can order him to play more and know that economic welfare will be enhanced because we value the extra 10 tournaments more than he disvalues it. That's sort of a reductio ad absurdum, isn't it? It's, it's just barking mad, and yet that's the implication. Okay, now how does the Chicago school fit in on this? They're the free enterprise school. They uh, adopt all of this crap, and what they say is, look, antitrust costs money. True, who could deny it? You have to have courts, you have to have lawyers, uh, this and that and the other, and um, sometimes the deadweight loss is bigger than the cost of pursuing it, in which case we should pursue it. Get it? And in other cases, the costs of pursue it, pursuing it are bigger than dead weight loss and we shouldn't. You see what, what free enterprises they are? <laughs> They're saying just because you have dead weight loss doesn't mean you should have an antitrust suit. Now I have to tell you my, uh, my antitrust joke. And I told this to um, a bunch of people who were lawyers and and uh, economists, all specializing in antitrust. I have a friend, Ben Klein, he was a professor at uh, UCLA, and he used to uh, specialize in money. And then one day he told me, there's no money in money. <laughs> you can't make much money studying money. Where is the money? Antitrust cases. Mises said to his wife, I'll be studying money, but I'll never have much of it. That was a quote from Mises to Margo, uh, Margaret, his wife. Well, there's not really that much money in money. There's a little bit, and people have done studies on uh, just who supports the Fed. <laughs> Guess. <laughs> Economists have been paid stuff there down their throat with a lot of money from the Fed in, in terms of uh, uh, going to five-star hotels here and there and being able to bring their wives or 
significant others. So there's a little bit of money in money, but the real money is in antitrust. So here's the antitrust joke. It's a two-part joke. And the first part is there were three Soviet prisoners. And as prisoners do, you people know you've been in prison. You, you, uh, <laughs> you, you talk to your buddy. Why are you in jail? Why are you in jail? And the first guy said, I was in jail because I came to work late. And they accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. OK, fine. The second guy said, I came to work early every day. And they accused me of brown nosing. You know what brown nosing? Okay. The third guy said, I came to work exactly on time every day, and they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. <laughs> so they put me in jail. And I got a big laugh out of the, uh, the economists and, and lawyers and other people who uh, batten off antitrust cases, whether on the uh, plaintiff or the defendant's side. And then I told the other joke. I said there were three prisoners in jail in the US uh, because of antitrust uh, violations. And as prisoners do, they were comparing notes. And the first guy said, I charged higher prices than everyone else. And they accused me of profit profiteering and gouging. Second guy said, I charged lower prices than everyone else. And they accused me of collusion and uh, cutthroat uh, competition and predatory pricing. And the third guy said, I charged the same prices as everyone else. It's hard to see how he did, given these other two guys. But what the heck, it's just a joke. You know, you've got to <laughs> give me a little leeway. And they accused me of collusion and cartelization. <laughs> the point is, no matter what you do, they can accuse you of an antitrust violation. Look, the law of murder and the law of rape are legitimate laws. You murder, you go to jail. You don't murder, you don't go to jail. You rape, you go to jail. You don't rape, you, you, you don't go to jail. But with antitrust, no matter what you do, they can get you. Poor Gil Bill Gates. He was out there in the boonies in uh, Washington state. Minding his own business, creating a nerddom and whatever he was doing. <laughs> and he wasn't paying off the boys in Washington. By the way, uh, I think seven out of the 10 richest counties in the country are all around Washington. It's just a coincidence. It's inexplicable why that should be. <laughs> the money goes there and comes back minus a little bit from, from, the, boys, <laughs> from the boys in Washington. And Bill Gates wasn't paying off either. You're supposed to pay off both, like Donald Trump. He would pay off the Democrats, pay off the Republicans. That's what a good businessman did. So they launched an antitrust suit against them. Why not? Uh, they're going to get them on something, higher, lower, the same prices, whatever. They'll get them. Murray Rothbard went through economic history, and he said there were certain presidents that were Morgan presidents, and they would go after the Rockefeller com com uh, companies. And then when a, a Rockefeller president got in, he'd go after the Morgan companies. It's just a crock. It's dead from the neck up. It's incoherent. No matter what you do, they can get you. And yet the mainstream love it. Uh, it getting back to an intermediate uh, microtext, you've got two or three or four chapters. Well, there's monopoly, and then there's Herfindahl index, there's oligopoly, duopoly, thisopoly, thatopoly. And, and they just love this stuff. Uh, you know, it, the more concentrated you are, the worse. You know, you start out, uh, well, how did McDonald's start out? It was just one store or two stores. And then it spread out because they served the public and, and made a, a good product and at a low price. And they outcompeted whatever was in the market. And now they can be subject to uh, monopolization. So that's a, a sharp distinction between Austrians and mainstream. Uh, Tom DiLorenzo has done a lot of good work on that. I'm not sure if he's speaking about this subject this time. but. Uh, if you read him, uh, he's, he's good on that one. OK, what else do we have? Uh, let's try transitivity and rationality and indifference. Another thing that the uh, mainstream love are indifference curves. There are always indifference curves. You know, here is an indifference curve. There's a, a good one. There's good two. There's indifference curve one uh, and indifference curve two. And, and here's a budget line. And, and uh, here we have another budget line. And we get a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, Giffen, um, Giffen good, the way you get a Giffen good, and, and the, you know, the, the um, income effect and the substitution effect and all that stuff. The Austrians reject this entirely. Not entirely. It's sort of, sort of like chess for economics, namely irrelevant but fun. <laughs> if, if you're weird and you like this stuff, there's nothing wrong with it per se as a mathematical exercise. 
But the problem is with indifference. There is no way to establish indifference. I bought this watch for 20 bucks. I demonstrated or revealed that I valued the watch at more than 20 bucks, otherwise I wouldn't have bought it for 20 bucks in the ex ante sense. Ex post, I might not value it at more than 20, it might not keep good time, but at the time I bought it, I valued it at more than 20 bucks, more than. The guy who sold it to me valued it at less than 20 bucks, otherwise he wouldn't have taken 20 bucks for the watch. How can you establish indifference? You can't. Now here I had another a, a big long debate with uh, Brian Kaplan on indifference because he wrote a thing why I'm not an Austrian economist and, and one of the things was uh, you know he loves indifference and Guido Holzman and I and about five others all attacked him in I think it was the Econ Eastern Economic Journal. They wouldn't publish any of our critiques. They only published his attack on Austrianism. Well that's the mainstream you know they, they don't like to have debates because they lose. <laughs> um, this reminds me of another story. I'll get back to this in a second. What happened was uh, some jerks uh, published an article saying, why is Austrian economics wrong? And the proof was there were fewer Austrians than there are mainstreamers. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, this was a serious article. It was published in a journal. Uh, Sherwin Rosen, a, a Chicago economist, I think it was him, published an article saying that uh, uh, the proof that, that Austrianism is wrong is that there are fewer Austrians than mainstream. I mean, can you imagine when the first guy said that the Earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around, and people said, well, you're wrong because more people believe the other way around? This is science? You know, uh, democracy? You take a, a nose count as to who believes what, and that's the truth? So my co-authors and I said, look, this is crazy. You know, and we gave all sorts of cases where the minority turned out to be right. But if you want an objective test of which is right, we've got an objective test. Now, we think that it's also wrong, but we're trying to reduct the ad absurdum. And what we said is that the last guy in a debate is the winner. And we got all sorts of debates between Austrians and mainstreamers, and uh, we got like 175 debates, and I think we had the last article in about 110 of them. So I said, on that basis, Austrianism is right. Now, obviously, that's just as silly, right? Because, you know, some people die in the middle of a debate, and you, <laughs> they, they can't reply, so you can't say, well, just because he died, or he doesn't think it's worthwhile, because you can't... Look, I, my articles are attacked by a lot of people, and I can't reply to all of them. There are so many. So some of them get the last word on me. So we're not seriously saying that he who gets the last word in a debate is the winner, but we're saying it's just as good as uh, counting noses to see who is the rightful winner, uh, you know, who is correct in, in economics. Okay, getting back to indifference. There's no way to establish indifference. Because every time you do anything, you establish preference. There's only preference. Look, you people are all here. You could have been in one of the other uh, debates, uh, one of the other uh, presentations. You could have been out bicycling or swimming or sleeping or eating or God knows what you could have been doing, but you're here. So you establish that you prefer this. Now, you might change your mind after you hear this nonsense emanating from the front of the room, but at the time you chose, you, I get that stuff from David Gordon. He tells me I have to do that. <laughs> There's only preference. Look, here are uh, two bottles of water. And a lot of people pick, you know, which one do you want? And most people would say, well, I'm indifferent. I don't really care which bottle. They're both perfectly good bottles of water. You see, the problem is that the... The word indifference is a perfectly good word in the English language. And it applies to things like this. And Brian Kaplan says, this shows indifference. And I say, no, it doesn't. Because what you're going to do is you're going to pick this one. Why did I pick this one? Oh, it's closer. Or maybe I picked this one, it's further away, and I need the exercise. To... <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, you all have bottles of water. You all have uh, things that are sort of uh, homogeneous. And you pick one of them. Right, you've got a few bottles of water. Why did you pick those when there could have been others? Well, who knows? You, you just sort of close your eyes and pick a bottle of water. But you pick that one, that shows you preferred it for some reason or other. Now look, we have a technical language in economics, and we also have an ordinary language. 
Ordinarily, I don't have no objection to the word indifference. It's a fine word. But as a matter of technical economics, it's all wrong. Let me give you an analogy from physics. In physics, work equals mass times distance. Namely, you have to move an object uh, through a certain distance, and that's what work is. Now, suppose, I, suppose these are 20-pound barbells, and I hold them like this. What's going to happen? <laughs> I'm going to start sagging soon, because it's hard to keep weights up at this angle. And the sweat is going to start dripping down my face. And in ordinary language, we would say, I'm working. That's a good exercise. You know, instead of lifting weights this way, you try this too. It, it really burns these muscles. And, and, and it's very, very hard, even five pounds. Try holding five pounds for one minute. And you're going to be, you're going to be sweating and, and breathing heavily. So you're working. But in physics, are you working now? Because assuming it's rigid, there's no movement of anything, there's no work. So in physics, they have an ordinary language and a technical language. Well, in economics, we can do that too. You've heard of penis envy? <laughs> there's physics envy. <laughs> physics envy is what economists have that want to make economics like physics, like testable hypotheses and stuff like that, whereas we Austrians there are certain hypotheses that are testable, namely the elasticity of shoes, as I mentioned, but there are others, namely the synthetic a priori, a predictive statements that are not testable. So to get back to indifference curves, the reason we reject indifference curves is because indifference is not a proper economic element. And then they're used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. They come up with Giffen goods which means an upward sloping demand curve. But the, the, the whole problem with that is that when you have a demand curve, uh, everything else is supposed to be constant. So along the demand curve, there's quantity, there's price, there's the demand curve, uh, income is supposed to be constant. If it's, if it's a, a true demand curve, namely ceteris paribus, everything else is constant, including income. And if income changes, as the price of this changes, like in the potato case with the, Ireland, where potatoes was such a big part of their uh, uh, diet, and uh, the price of potatoes moved up and down, and that heavily impacted income. Well, you're supposed to do a shift of demand curve. You're not supposed to move along a demand curve. So the Giffen good is nonsense. The Giffen good is beloved of the mainstream economists, and the Giffen good is, uh, comes out of this sort of thing where the income effect uh, is bigger than the substitution effect, that sort of thing. So it, you see, a lot of times you might think, well, you know, utils, big deal. But utils have important implications for antitrust. And you might think, well, uh, uh, indifference is really unimportant, but it has implications for the demand curve. And the demand curve is very important. Because one of the big fights in the, um, in the minimum wage fight is, are demand curves downward sloping or not? And these cretins, you know, <laughs> are by, you know, in every other way, they'll admit that if the price of peas rises, we'll have fewer peas. If the price of shoes falls, we'll have more shoes. Uh, when they want to get rid of, um, what is it, uh, abortions, those abortion clinics, the, the states in the South, what they do is they raise the criteria up through the roof. You know, you have to have uh, hospital uh, uh, attachments and all sorts of things in order to get rid of them. Well, that's what the minimum wage law is. Look, if the minimum wage law was so good, as Tom uh, Woods said the other night, uh, uh, the first night here, why uh, have foreign aid? Just tell Bangladesh to raise your minimum wage. Why have it at 15? Why be so niggardly? 15 is cheapskatey. Why not make it 50 or 500? We'll all be rich. <laughs> we can all make 500 an hour. I mean, the, the poverty, you know, with the stroke of Hillary, President Hillary's pen, uh, we can all be fabulously rich, but she's only doing it for 15. What's the matter with her? She's against the poor, <laughs> right? If I'm elected, I'll raise it to 5,000 an hour. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, what else do we have here? Um, externalities. That's another biggie. The, uh, the mainstream loves externalities. And uh, what's going on with externalities? What we have here, is, uh, education is the usual example that they use. And this is the quantity of education. 
And this is the price of education, and there's the demand curve, and there's the supply curve. And uh, this is the actual amount, quantity actual. That's the amount that will be bought in equilibrium, and that's reasonable. Here's, uh, remember I, I drew the, uh, what was it, the, um, the Venn diagram? The, that, that would be part of where we agree. This, so far, so good. But then what uh, Milton Friedman and the other people who, other free enterprises who uh, hate the market, uh, what they say is this demand curve is only private, private benefits. And there are spillover benefits or neighborhood effect benefits or positive externalities or external economy benefits. Namely, if you're educated, you're less likely to uh, be a criminal uh, you're more likely to vote more intelligently. You're more likely to be a good neighbor. Uh, this young lady is shaking her head. I'll get to that part in a second. But I agree with you. It's all nonsense. But I'm trying to present the, the case the way it's presented in the textbooks. And what they say is when you, you know, uh, with demand curves, you add up demand curves. This is demand curve A, and that's demand curve B. Then this would be the sum of the demand curves, right? You add them up. So what they're saying is this is private, but then there are also public benefits, and let's say the public benefits are here, so that when you get the sum, the demand, the sum of the demand curve, uh, you add this one and that one, and, and you get that one. Everyone with me? Mm -hmm. Namely, if we took the total demand, namely all the benefits of education, not only the internal ones that, you know, I'll get a better job, I'll get a better spouse, I'll, uh, you know, personal, you know, uh, I'll learn stuff, it, it'll edify me, whatever, but also the spillover benefits by me being educated, I'll help you guys, and you guys aren't paying me, and yet I'm benefiting you, you dirty rats. You ought to, you know, have some respect. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, we now have a, a total demand curve, and this is the quantity, call it ideal. Namely, that's how much education we should have if we took into account the external effects. And what are we going to do? Well, Friedman is going to have his voucher system, or we'll subsidize education. Somehow we've got to push us in that direction. And this is a market failure because uh, the market only takes into account selfish, personal, individual benefits. We don't take into account the, the fact that we're helping other people. There's no charity. I'm kidding here. I'm trying to refute the thing. Obviously, we do take into account other people. Or to put it in um, uh, neoclassical terms, other people's utility enters our utility function. We are made better off when other people are made better off, especially if we like them. Family members, kids, parents, whatever, friends. OK, so that's the argument. What's the refutation? Why is this wrong? Well, you know, just be, look, right now I'm smiling at you. See, teeth, smiling. And by the way, I take a shower once a month whether I need it or not. You people owe me. Hey, give me some money because I just smiled at you. Right? Or give me some money because I took a shower a month ago. I mean, what kind of an argument is that? Just because I benefit you, I can charge you? And, and that's the logic of this, that, that I'm entitled to tax you so that I'll have more education because I'm benefiting you. That, that, that's crazy. I mean, if we apply this, I'm, I'm a big fan of reductios ad absurdum. And a reductio ad absurdum is if, if every time you benefit someone else, you can charge them. Well, every time a woman wears a miniskirt, she should be able to charge everyone because all the guys, their eyes are bugging out. <laughs> and, and we should pay for her miniskirt. And you know, this is nonsense on wheels or nonsense on stilts. That's the word I was looking for, not, not on steroids, on stilts. Uh, this is nonsense. OK, so that's one refutation. Another refutation is. Where, where did Bernie Sanders get all of his buddies for the minimum wage? I'll tell you where. The People's Republic of Ann Arbor, the People's Republic of Cambridge, Mass., the People's Republic of San Francisco. And what's true in all these places? Lots of universities. And what do they learn at universities? Most of them don't take economics. They take sociology or feminist studies or uh, queer studies or God knows what studies, uh, black studies. And what they teach them is Marxism. So really, what we have is a case of external diseconomies. What we ought to do is tax education, because we've got too much of it. We should move this direction. Too much education. <laughs> <laughs> 
So there are problems here. Uh, when, uh, when am I supposed to go from 11 to 11.45 or? Oh, so I'm finished. Until you're finished, I can keep going. Well, I, I can keep going. I've got plenty of stuff, but uh, okay, let's do. Let's do negative externalities. Uh, <laughs> external diseconomies. The usual case there is pollution. So here we have supply and demand again, quantity and price. Uh, I'll just go another two minutes because otherwise those greedy people will beat us to lunch. <laughs> we don't want those greedy people to beat us. We, we greedy people want to beat them. Okay, so here's supply and demand and I'm producing these uh, wristwatches. And in order to produce wristwatches, I have uh, what's behind the supply curve is costs. Okay, fine. And th these are only private costs. And what are the private costs? Well, I have to pay my workers. I have to pay the raw materials. I have to pay insurance. I have to pay uh, to buy or rent a, a factory. I have to uh, uh, buy also machines to make the watches. Those are my private costs. What are the extra uh, external costs? I pollute you. When I produce these watches, out comes out of my smokestacks comes pollution. It gets into your laundry and, and your lungs. And we don't take that into account. So this is the actual quantity, quantity actual. But if we included the, uh, all the costs, we would have higher costs. And therefore, the optimal quantity optimal would be less. And now we've got to move us in that direction. OK? And, uh, now we have a debate between Pugu, who wants to have taxes, and Kos, who has cockamamie scheme that I don't have time to go into. And uh, we have uh, a government, um, you know, just um, uh, government would just tell people, you know, that hockey stick thing, you know, where, where we're polluting too much, and they would just say, uh, you can only pollute two thirds of what you're now polluting. Murray Rothbard, in the best article ever written on environmentalism, it's called something air pollution. It was 1982 in the Cato Journal. Uh, the first half of it is just libertarian law on property and, and uh, 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 trespass. And the second part, he applies this to, uh, uh, to the pollution case. And I'll summarize the second part of it. And what Murray says is that in the 1830s and 1840s, what you had was a, a spate of environmental cases where some little old lady hung out her wash on, on the line and it started out um, wet but clean, came back two hours later, dry but dirty, or you had a, a railroad uh, setting off sparks to the uh, um, haystack of the farmer and uh, burning the haystacks because of the sparks go 300 feet. And the plaintiff, the environmental plaintiff, would go to court and the court would pretty much uphold, not always, based on the evidence. This is not apodictic. This was an empirical examination. Did this guy uh, uh, trespass soot onto your property or onto your lungs or onto your haystacks? Soot or fire or whatever. And uh, this led to several good things. People would use anthracite coal instead of sulfur coal, even though anthracite costs more, because it uh, didn't pollute. And if it polluted, you'd get uh, some plaintiff who would demand a, a, a damages and a, an injunction. An injunction is a letter from the court saying, you know, you polluter, cut it out or we'll put you in jail. And damages. So uh, the economy was moved in a, an environmental direction, a green direction, if you will. And uh, there was even environmental forensics, trying to figure out where did this dust particle come from, from this factory or that factory. It wasn't much in the 1840s and 50s, but it was something. Now we move to the 1890s, 1900, 1910, and now we have the progressive period. Who was number one then? Great Britain. US wanted to become number one. To become number one, you need battleships, airplanes, tanks, guns, bullets, whatever. So the next time some environmental plaintiff came into court, the court said, yeah, yeah, they're violating your property rights, your stinking, lousy, selfish private property rights. There's something more important than your property rights, and that's, drum roll, the public good. And what does the public good consist of? Of letting manufacturers run wild. <laughs> because if you want to be number one, you, you can't take the side of a little old lady against the factory or a railroad, a, a stupid farmer. And that's why we uh, had pollution problems, and that's why we needed the Clean Air Act. But Murray, Murray's point was that if you could sue the environmentalist, uh, the polluter, you wouldn't have this externality. So this is not a market failure. This is a government failure, a government failure to uphold the law like they did in the 1830s and they didn't in the 19, 1910s. Thanks for your attention.